Philip to Evelyn, Saturday, January 2nd, 1943, 8.45 p.m. Evelyn, dearest, just as I hoped, two letters came through today, and I was exactly twice as thrilled as I usually am with one. Two records arrived with them, and the news is very encouraging, especially that big headline reading, German Army Wiped Out at Stalingrad which means we have approximately 300,000 less of the enemy to contend with. If you follow the news very closely, dear, you'll find many encouraging stories. Why don't you try it? Your letters seem to indicate you need bucking up. It hurts me to read of your discouragement and your ceaseless wondering when it will all end. You must try to curb your impatience, sweet. It does no one any good and makes you miserable. And don't give me your stock answer. I can't help it. You must help it. I've learned from plenty of experience that you can help yourself if you put your mind to it. You once told me you couldn't help running over, but you did a swell job of correcting that tendency. So you can't blame me for not believing you when you protest I can't help it. Sorry, sweet, if I seem to be hard and unsympathetic, you know in your heart of hearts that this is not page two, so. It's just that it hurts me so to know that you are brooding, pitying yourself, and feeling generally miserable because of me. If you have no regard for your own feelings, I must ask you to consider me. It does me no good, I assure you, to be reminded that I am the cause of your unhappiness. Besides, I know without being told what you are going through because I'm trying with all my might to overcome the loneliness, the heartache, the lack of you, and all it entails. So let's not torture each other in the future by writing of our misery. I know that I have been as much at fault as you in the past, but it's time we assumed a healthier, more realistic viewpoint for the good of both of us. Agreed? The sun finally decided to give us a break today and served to brighten our thoughts and outlook generally. I was room orderly today, which means I had a mess of cleaning to do, readying for inspection. From 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., I was busy sweeping, mopping, dusting, washing windows, etc. You should have seen me, baby. It would have been a revelation to you. Maybe I shouldn't be telling you this. But you wouldn't take advantage of it, or would you? After I cleaned up, I was given permission by the sergeant to duck out. Remind me to tell you the army term for this. Until after inspection, since I was still in my fatigue clothes. So I strolled over to the PX with my fellow RO, Hugh Cumby. Page 3, a swell guy with the story where we killed a couple of hours gabbing about this and that over chocolate milkshakes. Incidentally, no stockings. Sorry. When we got back, it was just time for mail call, and I was overjoyed when I found two letters and two papers. I rushed through a swell lunch of hot dogs, two, sauerkraut, mashed potatoes, string beans, and bread pudding, so that I might get back to reading the mail at leisure. But, as it turned out, it had to wait because that expletive, Sergeant Bowie, decided he wanted a couple more ditches dug. This took till one o'clock when I finally got around to opening my mail. Well, honey, I had a perfectly swell time reading and rereading your hot and cold, optimistic, pessimistic letters. The news that Jeanette had a boy came as no great surprise. I kind of felt that's what it would be, and though I doubt if she'd remember it, after what seems ages and ages, she once told me, or rather, she prophesied a prophecy that has come amazingly true. We were riding home on a bus from Blackwood, New Jersey, where we went to a movie, when, coming out of a thoughtful mood, she said, Phil, someday you will marry, and so will I. And then your wife will have a baby, and so will I, and the babies will be of opposite sexes. I think that subconsciously I remembered her words, for I took it for granted she would have a boy. I say subconsciously 
because I never gave her words a second thought until I read the announcement card today. And page four, it all came back to me. We'll wait until I get home to send our congratulations since you would like, since you would like it that way. Another phrase in one of your letters intrigued me. I mean the one in parentheses, my flow has stopped completely. I'm hoping that was a hint and a promise. I was very much surprised to hear that our offspring is over eight pounds. I never imagined babies picked up weight at so fast. It's almost time for lights out, sweetheart. So I'll sign off with all my love to my sweet chippy with a little left over for the princess Adele. Bless her little heart. Love to all from your devoted Phil. Evelyn to Phil, January 3rd, 1943, 4.30 p.m. Dearest, this will be my last letter previous to your visit home. I took the parlor covers off because I promised to give them to the tailor tomorrow. You can put them on though. As far as going to the bank, the weather has been extremely miserable and I was afraid to chance catching a cold. Furthermore, there's no further need for financial worry. I received two checks, one from Sharp and Dome for $13.80, insurance for September, October, November, and December, and one from the telephone company, refund of deposit for $5.28. Not bad, eh? At page two, Lise will be able to go shopping when you are home. I weighed Adele today, and she is now 8 pounds, 10 ounces. Yesterday, as you can already see, I received two letters from you, my adorable Phil. Darling, when you receive this, you'll have just a few more hours to start for home, and you're impatient and loving babies. Every minute is an hour when I'm waiting for you, dear, but when you are home, every hour is a minute. Hurry, will you? Jack and Gloria went to New York today with Ethel and Al, and we'll be back page three on Tuesday. I set Gloria's hair and it looked swell. My mom told me I looked tired, so please, honey, don't expect too much of me. I try my darndest to rest and look well, but the routine is knocking me, but definitely. You'll find out. Yesterday, Adele didn't have one clean, dry diaper, and I had to wash, scrub, boil, and rinse three dozen diapers. My mom was unable to come in, and the wash accumulated, and I only did the diapers. Imagine. Last night, Jack S., Mom and I sat in the bedroom and watched Adele's every motion. Honest, sweet. Page four. You can't stop looking at her. She's that adorable and pretty. Mickey Gordon is here with my cousin Ruthie and sends his best regards. I think Harry and Goldie will marry shortly if things continue to run smoothly. Goldie is well fixed. Her mother left her money. And Goldie's dad said he will take Harry into the business if he can't get work after the war. However, her dad wants them to wait a while till things are more definite. I love you, I love you, I love you, sweet husband, and can't wait till I can throw my arms around you and say once more, I love you. Evie. Philip to Evelyn, Sunday, January 3rd, 3.40 p.m. Darling Chippy, having begged off KP in favor of doing it tomorrow, I have a peaceful, restful day at my disposal. I've already disposed of the greater part of it reading Thorn Smith's Topper. It's put me in a mellow, sentimental mood, and I feel like I want to bury my nostrils in your hair and kiss your throat just where it curves away from the side of your jaw. It's only two days until I start home, but I'm so impatient with the craving for you that the minutes drag like hours. What fellows are in the barracks now are relaxing in the best tradition of a Sunday afternoon. Some reading, some writing, some just plain sleeping, all with one ear cocked toward the radio, which is spilling sweet music all over the place. I'm so thankful for these Sundays, when all the fretting, worrying, responsibility, fall out, fall in, hut two, three, four, are temporarily forgotten, 
and our minds and bodies are blissfully dormant and our thoughts naturally turn to the things that make life so sweet. Home, sweetheart, good times. Baby, if you were sitting beside me here on my bunk, I shouldn't ask for anything more for the time H2B, to make life beautiful and complete. As it is, the mere thought of you, the picture of you that I carry in my head, warms me through and through with a penetrating sweetness that is born of the clearly perceived light in your eyes, the intimate quality of your smile, the well-remembered tenderness of your arms about my neck, your delicious lips on mine, your exciting yielding body pressed close to mine, and numerous intimate pictures which are felt rather than seen and are beyond my humble capacity to describe, but are integral parts of the whole. Is it any wonder, sweet, that I cling to the memory of you and hold it up before my gratified senses at every opportunity? After a day of sunshine, the weather decided not to spoil us by being over magnanimous and favored us with more rain today. But the gray skies don't trouble me at all because I have the sunshine in my heart and mind. I feel unwantedly close to you at this moment, sweet. And while I'm feeling this way, nothing in this world has the power to disturb me. No mail from you today, but the pleasure is not lost entirely. Just postponed till tomorrow. Sorry about the mailless days that so distress you, dear, but it's no fault of mine as I write every day. Be a little more tolerant of the delay. You know what the U.S. mail is up against these page three days. Glad to hear that you and Mom are managing to keep up with your household duties and that the tailor's bill was so reasonable. I told you those U.S. pins would turn up but though I have no use for them myself, having provided myself with the one I needed a few weeks back, you might follow the example of some girls I've seen and polish them with a little knox on and wear them as ornaments on your tan sport coat. Want to know something, honey? One of the things that prompts me to look forward to my forthcoming visit with such expectancy is the prospect of seeing my chippy once again. I mean the old Chippy, the one I fell in love with, slim and straight and graceful and becomingly dressed and altogether lovely. When you stop to consider it, baby, and please do, the first thing I loved about you was the way you looked when you dressed up. I'll never forget how proud I was to be seen with you on those occasions. Remember the fuss everyone made over the white bunny? Remember how one and all admired you in your big white straw and the dress with the multicolored skirt? And what a sweet bride you were in your hastily acquired aquamarine outfit. There's a lot of truth in that oft-repeated bromide. It's the little things in life that count. At least I know it's the for little things that are best remembered. My request for a key wasn't as silly as you seem to think. Of course, you couldn't know that I had an ulterior motive, so I'll forgive you for failing to send it. I just thought it would be nice if I could contrive to get into the house without waking you, undressing, getting oh so close to my sleeping sweetheart, and then kissing her awake. I think you would have liked that as much as I. If I catch the 3.55 p.m. from Columbus, I might arrive at the house anywhere from 4 to 6 a.m., and there was the possibility that you might be asleep. At any rate, it was such a small thing to do, and henceforth, remember, darling, that I usually have a pretty good reason for any demand I may make upon you. What's more important, my reason for may not be the obvious one. Someday you'll learn what an imaginative, sentimental guy your hubby is, and you'll know that if I ask for a thing, for a key, it doesn't necessarily mean that I want it for the sole purpose of opening the door. Naturally, I'm disappointed at the hitch in my plan, but whatever the circumstances of our getting together, I know it will be inexpressibly sweet and exciting. Come on Wednesday. 
I know you don't, I don't have to remind you to have everything in order and looking nice for me, so I won't. My everlasting love to you, my sweet, and to the princess, and to all the folks, as ever, Phil.